tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Over a three-day period in Houston, Texas, investigators are called to the scene of two brutal murders. Both women are found in their cars. They look surprisingly alike. And most shocking of all, they share the same name, Mary Morris. Is there a connection? Or are these crimes an astonishing coincidence? An Oklahoma dairy farmer leaves his home with a mysterious stranger and never returns. Several sightings have given his family hope that he is still alive. After 35-year-old Lita Sullivan was found murdered, her husband Jim had this to say. I had nothing to do with Lita's death. However, Lita's mother said this. I really would like to see Jim go to the electric chair. Did Jim Sullivan hire a hitman? With a wave of his hands, this Russian immigrant claims he can heal. Dozens flock to his Boston office every week to be treated. Can he relieve pain, cure phobias, and help smokers quit? Does he truly have a magic touch, or is he too good to be true? These four cases are among the most unusual and intriguing that we have yet encountered. Join me for this fascinating edition of Unsolved Mysteries. Houston, Texas. Very early one clear October morning, Jay Morris saw his wife Mary off to work. Mary Morris was a 48-year-old bank loan officer with many friends and a successful career. However, by early that afternoon, Jay began to worry about his wife. He had tried to phone her several times, but she hadn't returned any of his calls. So I called a supervisor and found out she wasn't at work. And then that's when I knew immediately that there was something wrong because she didn't miss work. Meanwhile, about three miles east of the Morris home, a passerby made a gruesome discovery. Inside a smoldering car, he found a body burned beyond recognition. The police were notified, and the crime scene investigation unit was soon combing the area for evidence. By that time, Jay had begun to think the worst. So when he heard from a friend about a burned out car found near the interstate, he picked up his stepdaughter, Marilyn Blaylock, and drove to the scene. Marilyn and I went down and the police was there, but they had everything blocked off and they told us to turn around and come back home. I was frustrated that they wouldn't tell me, but at that point, I still wasn't thinking that it was her. However, within a few hours, detectives delivered the terrible news. They had identified the victim in the car as Mary Morris. Because of the condition of the body, it was impossible to determine how Mary had been killed. The crime was so brutal, police did not suspect robbery was the motive. But soon, every other avenue of investigation also turned into a dead end. There was no reason for it whatsoever. She was just a really a good person, you know, never did anything bad to anybody. They asked everything from gambling to drugs to affairs to anything, and all the answers were no. She didn't gamble, she didn't drink, nothing. Just three days after Mary Morris's death, however, the case took a strange twist, and the circumstances were as chilling as they were unbelievable. Not far from where Mary's body was found, another woman had been viciously murdered. She too was killed in her car. And incredibly, her name was also Mary Morris. Two women, both named Mary Morris, both found murdered in their cars in the Houston area just three days apart. On top of all that, the two Marys also bore a certain resemblance. 
However, to find a possible link, detectives would first have to piece together the events surrounding the death of the second victim. Mary McGinnis Morris was 39 years old when the first Mary was killed. And like Mary Lou Morris, she too was a successful professional with a sunny disposition. Mary was like an angel. She was very joyful, always happy, making people laugh. Not enough words really to describe her. I mean, she was just really loved by everybody. I'll call you in the morning, okay? Mary was a nurse practitioner in charge of several Thank clinics you. for a major industrial corporation. Thank you. She was dedicated and excelled at her job. Bill. Anything basically a doctor would do, Mary did. She would work. 14 hours a day, not think twice, go back in of an evening, weekends, whenever she was needed. Mary got along well with her staff, but according to friends, one new employee, a male nurse, was a poor fit right from the start. And the relationship quickly went from bad to worse. Mary became increasingly nervous and distraught. She told me that she was afraid of this person that she worked with, and I said, do you really think he could hurt you? And she said, yes, I do, and I think he could do worse. Soon after, Mary told friends she stopped by her office one evening to pick up some papers, only to make a disturbing discovery. She found things out of place on her desk, pictures turned to face the wrong direction. On his desk was written the words death to her which she assumed was written about her. She made a phone call to me on her way home, and uh, she, I could tell that she was, that she was shaken. <sighs> OK, baby, what's going on? Honey, this whole thing is really out of control. She got home, and she asked me if I would provide her with a gun to carry with her for her own protection. She asked me to go over the, the handling and use of the gun. When we were finished, she asked me to place the gun in her car under the driver's seat. A few weekends later, Mary met her friend Lori Gemmel at the clinic to give her an allergy shot. Mary seemed fine that Sunday, and we chatted a little bit about her making dinner for the family, and she had a couple of errands to do, and she was only gonna stay a couple of hours, and then she was gonna go home. Later that afternoon, Lori says she received an alarming phone call from Mary. Hi, it's me. When she was in the drugstore, she saw somebody that gave her the creeps. She said, I'm just going to run across the bridge and turn off my computer and sign out of the building and, and go home. Police aren't sure what happened next, but 12 minutes after saying goodbye to Lori, Mary made a frantic call to 911. We're not releasing the content of the tape. It covers the attack that happened to Mary. And anybody that's ever heard that tape has uh, just had their blood chilled listening to it. It's, it's a very chilling, disturbing call. The details of Mary's abduction are unclear. However, the medical examiner's report revealed that she was viciously beaten and shot in the head. The investigation first led police to Mary's co-worker at the clinic. Allegedly, he had left on bad terms, quitting his job after several failed attempts to discredit Mary. Detectives say they have evidence that may link the co-worker to the crime, and he remains a suspect. Investigators also had questions for Mike Morris, Mary's husband. Morris claimed he was at the movies with his daughter at the time of the murder. Detectives had concerns about his alibi and uncovered several other troubling issues. First, according to police, Morris intentionally stonewalled the investigation through his own actions and by refusing to allow his daughter to be questioned. He wouldn't meet with us without an attorney. Witnesses don't need attorneys. Suspects generally have attorneys. Mike Morris says he was simply following the advice of some trusted friends. Several of these people suggested that I take an attorney with me, not because I had anything to hide, but just to have somebody with me that was familiar with the procedures. 
Detectives were also suspicious about Morris' refusal to take a polygraph test. I was on anti-anxiety medications. I was on antidepressants. I wasn't really sure that, that this polygraph examination that they were talking about could adequately compensate for all of those conditions. Further, according to friends, Mike and Mary Morris were having serious problems with their marriage. When Mike heard rumors of an alleged affair between Mary and a family friend, he confronted them head on. I can tell you that at the time that that happened, they both looked me in the eye and they both told me that, that there had been nothing inappropriate in their relationship. And I didn't see any betrayal in their eyes. Then there was a question of motive, what detectives say compelled them to follow the money, a life insurance policy that would pay out $700,000. There was a large amount of life insurance on Mary Morris, which Mike Morris was the beneficiary too. There were a lot of reasons right there for, uh, in the way of a motive for Mike. Finally, what police consider most curious of all the evidence against Mike Morris was a call he made to Mary's cell phone around the time detectives believed she was murdered. There was a phone call some two hours after Mary Morris made a very desperate and chilling call to 911. That call was made by Mike Morris. The problem is this phone call lasted for four minutes. This was, by all indications of the cellular telephone company, a completed call. What you have to wonder is, what did that phone call either set in motion or uh, end? Normally, um, the, the cellular service would have kicked in and, and said that the, uh, that the party you were calling was unavailable. Uh, I didn't get that. I don't know why I didn't get that. But as long as the phone was ringing and I thought that there was a possibility that she would answer it, I let it ring. But if the call went unanswered, detectives questioned why it showed up on Mary's cell phone bill. I don't accept that Mike made this phone call and that the phone rang for four minutes. It's not possible. The, the question is, who answered the phone on the other end? That's what the big question is. And what did they talk about for the four minutes? Was Mike Morris talking to his wife's killer? He adamantly denies any involvement in her death. I had absolutely nothing to do with the arrangement of Mary's murder. It's a hurtful insinuation, um, but you know, I know that it's, it's absolutely untrue. Despite Mike Morris's denial, police say they have not eliminated him as a suspect in his wife's murder. Mary's co-worker is also still under suspicion. Perhaps the answer lies in the possible link between the deaths of Mary McGinnis Morris and Mary Lou Morris. One theory speculated that an inept contract killer had been hired to murder the second Mary Morris and kill the first Mary Morris by mistake. That theory was fueled in part by a telephone call allegedly made to a Houston newspaper. A call came into the Houston Chronicle, and I verified this with somebody at the Chronicle. Between the time the first Mary Morris was killed and the time my friend was killed, saying something to the effect that they got the wrong Mary Morris the first time. The hit-gone-wrong theory was further bolstered when detectives determined that the wedding ring of the first Mary Morris was missing. If someone had put a hit out on a person, that's what they take back to show that they actually killed that person. Despite speculation that the two murders may have been connected, detectives had their doubts. Well, with the remoteness of the location where the uh, victim was found, as well as the effort that was taken to, you know, destroy the evidence and, and the vehicle, um, that would be consistent, you know, with a, you know, contract killing. But with the background of the victim, uh, that doesn't seem likely. That the first Mary Morris was a, was a mistake, uh, it was a missed hit, a, a botched hit, something like that. There's not anything uh, that we found that would... Uh, support that. 
Detectives continued their search for any clues that might connect the two Mary Morrises, but came up empty. They later concluded that with nearly 300 homicides in Harris County that year, the murders were a bizarre coincidence. However, the family and friends of both Marys believe that explanation is simply too far-fetched. The astronomical odds that two Mary Morrises was killed three days apart, very similar in looks, to me is, that's what it is, astronomical if they're not connected. I can't help but think they have to be related. I can't imagine that two women with the same name would be murdered within three days of each other, both found in their cars, and not have that be related. It began as a typical morning at Leonard Derrickson's dairy farm near Cheyenne, Oklahoma. Jared, breakfast is ready. Leonard made breakfast for his 19-year-old son, Jared. And the two sat down to eat before a long day of chores. Then at 9 a.m., a visitor arrived unannounced in a white pickup truck. Jared, you know whose truck that is? I'll go see what he wants. You wait inside. Leonard spent several minutes talking to the driver of the truck. They did not appear to know each other but their conversation was cordial. When Leonard returned, he told Jared that the man wanted to look at one of his stud horses. Why don't you put about uh, 25 bales out in that back pasture? Leonard gave no sign that he found anything unusual about the stranger. So he told me that he was gonna go with him. He said to stay here and go to Elk and get some feed and go feed the cows, and he'd be back that afternoon. Three years later, Jared Derrickson is still waiting for his father to come home. On March 14th, Leonard Derrickson voluntarily left his home with an unidentified man and never returned. Nobody has any idea what happened to him. To this day, police have found no signs of a struggle, no evidence of foul play, and no body. Their only clue is a mysterious man who came to Leonard's house. Authorities believe he is the key to explaining Leonard Derrickson's baffling disappearance. After leaving his home, Leonard Derrickson did not simply vanish. Two hours later, a waitress claims to have seen him eating breakfast with another man at a local coffee shop. Now, that's a little odd to us because at 9 o'clock, Leonard just got through eating breakfast with his son. It's extremely odd to eat two breakfasts in the same day, two hours apart. They were uh, sitting there in the restaurant, and the unknown man that we're trying to identify was doing most of the talking, and Leonard was just uh, drinking coffee and listening to the uh, the man talk. The man at the diner matched the description of the man who picked Leonard up at his home. There was nothing suspicious about his behavior. And if he had meant to harm Leonard, why would he be seen with him in a public place? Police next checked the barn where Leonard kept his stud horse. But Leonard never came there that day. In fact, an exhaustive investigation turned up absolutely no information on Leonard's whereabouts until six months after he vanished. But this sighting was even more perplexing than the first. A man at a bar in Amarillo, Texas, phoned the police. Yeah, I want to report this guy, Leonard Derrickson. He's supposed to be missing. The individual that called stated, I know Leonard Derrickson. I'm from Elk City. I can't give you my name, but he's in this bar. I know who he is. I know this is him. 
I'm watching him. He's wearing a blue check shirt, and he's drunk. Yeah, I'm at, I'm at the uh, Highway Bar in Amarillo. Yeah, 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 I'll wait till you get here. All right. And then the call terminates. By the time local police arrived at the remote bar, both the caller and the man he claims as Leonard Derrickson were gone. Hi. Hi. My name is Joey. The following day, the Roger Mills County Sheriff's Department interviewed the bartender. I remember the guy who made the two phone calls. She remembered the caller being at the bar and corroborated his story. We had no reason to disbelieve it. It would almost stretch the imagination that a guy would dance around in the bar screaming and hollering, it's Leonard, it's Leonard, and it not be Leonard. I believe he was in the bar in Amarillo. But why was Leonard Derrickson hanging out in an Amarillo bar six months after being reported missing? Could he have voluntarily disappeared? If so, why? Leonard had recently suffered through a painful divorce, and investigators believe his dairy business was collapsing, along with a rapidly dropping price of milk. Could Leonard have decided to escape both his alleged financial and personal problems once and for all? It's entirely possible that Leonard left on his own. I don't know where he would be today. I believe it's possible that he's working as a ranch hand somewhere or on a dairy or a cattle ranch or even horses. There is only one problem with that scenario. Leonard's son, Jared. Me and my dad, we was together every day. Every morning we'd go work, do the chores, and I'd go to school. I don't think he would have ever left me and not ever come back to sit me or nothing because we was close. And I don't think he'd ever done that to me. And there's no way he would have ever left Jared and gone off and not ever let anybody know he was too close. We were all too close, a family, to do that. If Leonard would not have left his son behind, the focus then switches back to the mysterious man. One aspect of this case has always troubled investigators. Jared did not know the man. And Leonard did not act as if he did either. But then how did the stranger know where Leonard lived? And why was he asking about a horse that Leonard had not advertised as for sale? Where Leonard lived north of uh, Cheyenne, Oklahoma, the man would have had to known how to have gotten there because it's just not a straight drive there the way you have to turn and go on the back roads and things. So he knew uh, the area to get there. Someone had given him directions how to get to Leonard's uh, home. There's a possibility that, that this man was involved in setting Leonard up uh, to be murdered. If this man didn't do the murder, he may have taken Leonard somewhere to someone that wanted to. That's a possibility. We just, we don't have a motive for that, uh, have not found one. Without a motive, the search for Leonard Derrickson will continue to be hampered. Until then, his family can only pray that Leonard is safe and well somewhere and will someday return home. To never, ever hear anything, it's hard because there's no end to it. And for a year after I would listen to the news and they would say they had found a body someplace, you know, I would just think, maybe that's him, maybe this is it but nothing anywhere. This is a composite drawing of the man last seen with Leonard Derrickson. He was driving a white Ford pickup and wearing a baseball hat with the phrase, no fear, on the front. Police would like to question him regarding Leonard's disappearance. Leonard Derrickson is six feet tall has brown hair and weighs approximately 200 pounds. January 1987, the exclusive area of Buckhead in Atlanta, Georgia. 
a woman lay dead in the doorway of her home. Her name was Lita McClinton Sullivan, the daughter of one of Georgia's most politically prominent African-American families. Her husband was James Sullivan, heir to a million-dollar family fortune. Police had no idea who killed Lita or why. The only clue was a dozen blood-spattered roses. Who killed Edith Sullivan? Authorities are left with a baffling mystery. Could Lita have been the victim of a random robbery attempt? Or could her own husband have been involved in a conspiracy to commit murder? James Sullivan met Lita McClinton at an Atlanta mall in 1975. Lita was training to be a clothing buyer for a department store. Excuse me. Hi. Hi. Can I help you find something? Uh, a Boston native, James Sullivan was refined and charming. Lita soon fell in love. How about a trip to Paris? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> when James Sullivan married into Lita's family, her parents feared that his real motive was to capitalize on the political influence that the McClinton family had earned through years of public service. I think that was one of his attractions to Lita. He needed someone who could uh, uh, give him a better social standing and status. Eventually, the couple moved into this home in Palm Beach, Florida. I'm going back to work. You can't. Lita's parents say that in time, Sullivan wanted to control every aspect of their daughter's life. He had originally said that he did not want her to work, but then he would give her such a small budget that it was no way uh, practical to, uh, quote, buy groceries, to uh, take care of the household and things like that. In 1985, Lita filed for divorce and left her husband moving into a townhouse they owned in Atlanta. Lita's family says Sullivan was outraged and feared he could lose millions in a divorce settlement. The day Lita was scheduled to testify in her divorce case was the same day she was murdered. Police would discover that a witness had seen a man come to the door carrying a box of flowers. Flowers for Lita Sullivan? Are you Lita Sullivan? Yes. Although the suspect was seen fleeing the property, he could not be identified. At the time of the killing, Lita's husband, James, was at the couple's home in Palm Beach. He had an alibi, unless it was a contract killing. 40 minutes later, Jim Sullivan receives a collect phone call from outside Atlanta. And when I retraced the time from Buckhead where Lita was murdered to where the phone booth was, it was exactly 40 minutes. I believe the killer was calling Sullivan and telling him that the job is done. Police traced the flowers to a shop where a clerk remembered a nervous man buying them before the murder. Okay. They said the telephone records showed that just before the killing, three men who had checked into a Georgia motel using false identification made calls to Sullivan's home. Police now thought they had a case to take to trial. They were wrong. The judge dismissed the case for lack of evidence. A relieved James Sullivan spoke with the press following the decision. I want everyone listening to this to know that I am absolutely innocent. I had nothing to do with Lita's death. Her death was a great tragedy. And I thank God and my attorneys that this ordeal is over. Lita's family believed James Sullivan was getting away with murder. Jim had Lita killed because of money. Jim loved money. Just eight months after the murder, Sullivan married again. Perfect. This time to a woman named Suki Rogers. But three years later, Suki and Sullivan were involved in their own bitter divorce. In 1991, 
Suki told police that Sullivan admitted to her that he hired someone to kill Lita. The McClintons filed a $4 million civil suit against Sullivan and won. We're not interested in the money. It was really knowing that Jim was a perpetrator. He was a cause of our daughter's death, and we wanted to bring him to trial. Officials believe Sullivan's motive for murder was his intense desire not to part with any of his fortune, but they still didn't think there was enough physical evidence to win a criminal conviction. Lita's devastated family said James Sullivan had gotten away with murder. February 1998. Georgia investigators arrest a man they suspect helped set up Lita's murder. I had a business arrangement with Mr. Sullivan about 11 years ago. The man alleged that James Sullivan masterminded the killing. You know, I, Finally, I, I, a warrant was issued for Sullivan's arrest. He was charged with murder and aggravated assault. But before police could find him, Sullivan disappeared. Sullivan had an Irish passport, and authorities believe he may have fled to Ireland. He planned it. And I really, really feel that he should. I just feel that he should pay with his life. I tell him uh, what he already knows. He'll never beat me. I will get him. This brownstone in Boston is filled with patients, people with real ailments hoping to be healed. I'm here to quit smoking, and I've been smoking over 30 years. Fear of crowds like this. And I came to stop biting my fingernails. But this is not a medical facility. It is the office of Yufim Shabensov a Soviet immigrant affectionately known as the Mad Russian. Relax, make yourself down cold. My name is Efim Shubinsev. Efim seems to have an unexplained power that cures. Thousands have flocked from all over the world to experience his healing touch. For me right now, people can make appointments. Smoking, drinking, drugs, all kinds of bad habits, phobias, anorexia, bulimia, weight loss, Knee pain, mm -hmm. and back pain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yes. Can this Russian wonder really heal? Or is he a charlatan playing on people's hopes? Can the simple wave of a hand change a life? You be the judge. Miranda Beeson is a successful New York businesswoman with an addiction. She couldn't quit smoking. I really adored smoking, and I smoked great cigarettes. I won't name the brand. I loved them all. But I had tried numerous other kinds of ways of smoking cessation, and they had not been successful, and I thought, I have nothing to lose. So Miranda went to Boston for a session with Yefim and smoked what she hoped was her last cigarette. OK, OK, be brave, be brave, be brave, because what we have to do is we have to Inside, Miranda joined a dozen others looking for a final cure to their chronic pain or addiction. For $65 per session, Yefim holds a group healing followed by individual meetings. Initially, he tries to alleviate any overt pain. I want to ask questions here of everybody. Uh, who have pain, phobia, uh, some addiction of some sort? You have, who have everybody, you have, why are you here, why are you here? Um, I want to quit smoking. You want to quit smoking. Good. He's incredibly dynamic. Okay. You have other pain? Yes. Pain. You have pain. Where do you have pain? In my back. In you have he has a power of focus so that when he focuses on you, you're engaged. I give you energy. Oh. He kind of sent this fireball across the room, and that pain is gone. 
Yefim claims his hand gestures are a reorganization of what he calls bioenergy. It's like somebody throwing a really fast curveball. You're the catcher, he's the pitcher, you're there, you catch it. What I want you to do is to think in your mind the first, very first puff of cigarette that you take. In her one-on-one -on -one session, they discuss her specific problem, Miranda's 20-year addiction to cigarettes. Well, some people say he sort of sneezes on you, which is not what he does at all. But he kind of gives you this parting gift. After her session, Miranda's desire for cigarettes disappeared. She claims the craving stopped. I was somehow profoundly changed. I just know that I'm greater than this habit at this point. So it cannot move in. Since her visit to Euphem over two years ago, Miranda has remained a non-smoker and believes that Euphem was key to her success. According to Euphem, he has helped thousands like Miranda and thousands more who suffer from another common addiction, overeating. Her weight loss, I helped dramatically. I removed desire to eat whatever you want. I removed desire to eat in between meals. I removed desire to eat big portions, etc., etc. But exercise I cannot do instead of you. Louise Cole is a single mother living in Bradenton, Florida. When both her young children became seriously ill, the emotional stress and financial pressure were overwhelming, and Louise began to overeat. I would uh, actually hide food just, just for emergencies for me and uh, because I knew that it did comfort me. So after things were quiet and everything was taken care of, instead of falling apart emotionally and exhaustedly crying or you know, just falling to sleep, I would uh, go to the kitchen and bring out my goodies. Chocolate is probably one of my favorite things. And I would get so excited because I'm gonna, I'm looking through the top of the chocolate and I'm thinking, okay, this is my favorite, I'm gonna eat this, I'm gonna eat that. Knowing in the back of my mind, it didn't matter which one I started with because I was gonna finish the box. Louise tried to end the binging, but couldn't. And when I reached 187 pounds, I realized that now it's not an ego issue, it's a health issue. I went from the um, high protein diets, the low carb diets, the watermelon diet, a grapefruit diet. I took prescription diet pills, and uh, none of these worked. Just, just could not get it. Louise decided to take a chance and visit Yefim. After her session, she immediately felt different and within three months saw positive results. I had lost 17 pounds, and now it's down to 20 pounds. So I feel good about that. I think it's a, it's a very healthy one to two pounds a week, and I, I like that. I have a new feeling and outlook uh, emotionally towards food. It will never have the power over me that it once had. But where did Yefim's gift for healing come from? Well, as he tells it, he was delivering artwork one day, and a stranger walked up to him on the street and said something about his having a very strong energy field. Yafim. It turned out to be a researcher from a Soviet laboratory that was studying the paranormal. And this person persuaded him to come to the laboratory and have some tests conducted. Evidently, when he put his hands on or over plants, the plants perked right up. At one point, a researcher in the laboratory was suffering from a migraine, and without really quite knowing what he was doing, he removed the pain. He took the pain away. And that's when he realized that, although he wasn't quite sure what he was doing, he was definitely doing something to heal people. In 1979, Yafim moved to America, where his curative powers were soon touted by the media. Yafim also attracted the attention of the medical world. In 1982, two Harvard University Health Service doctors decided to do a clinical trial. The goal was to verify Yafim's success rate Two psychotherapists asked Yefim to come and work with a number of patients of theirs whom they had treated without success. These were people with fear of needles, phobias, smoking, pain. 
they first observed the healing sessions. Are you actually a doctor? No, I'm not a doctor. Well, can you help me get over my fear of needles? Well, of course I can, of course. I. Why don't you sit in this chair? Come over here, sit here. Now, I watch, watch, watch. There, yeah. yeah. Anybody have questions for me? Nobody question? The doctors then kept track of the trial group for four months. He saw all of these patients and managed to cure 85% of them. Tell me about the tetanus shot. Well, when I went into the doctor's office, I, I wasn't nervous at all. I had no fear of the needle. Uh, there was no when anxiety, the Harvard doctors uh, no studied nausea, what he had done, line. they were able to conclude that he had not hypnotized anyone. No, no, it wasn't like hypnosis at all. It was uh, more like In fact, they weren't really sure what he had done. They just knew that whatever he did, it worked. The published results from the Harvard trial state that Yafim's powers were genuine, as were the positive results. The Harvard study, at most, shows that there is some real effect here, most probably a placebo effect. And when they state that something real happened, they don't mean real psychic power or anything like that, but that a real mental power in the, in the patients themselves happened. I don't think Yefim has any special power at all other than the power to convince people that they can implement change in their own lives. Although Yefim's gift remains undefinable, both Miranda and Louise believe in it. I don't think anybody knows how it works. I just know that it does work, and it, I've been very successful with it. You may go see him and say, I don't understand a word this man says. I don't know what he's doing. You can be suspect, or you can say, you know what, I go around once. What do I have to lose? It is hard not to be intrigued by the mad Russian and his mystifying energy. But is he able to heal with a wave of a hand? Or is it only the power of suggestion that is at work here? The truth remains an unsolved mystery. For more cases that are stranger than fiction, stories all the more remarkable because they are true. Join me next time on Unsolved Mysteries.